Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to Gather and Go, the podcast that helps you plan, promote, and lead better trips. I'm Brian Jewell. I'm your host, and I am totally thrilled that you decided to spend some of your time with us today. And as always, our promise to you is that we're going to do everything we can to make that investment of your time worth your while. Now, I am really excited about today's episode because I'm excited for you to meet my friend and the subject of our featured conversation, Andre Marable. Now, if you don't know Andre, he is the founder of the Pack Road Trip Travel Club, and he is here to tell us about how he has cracked the code for building awesome group tour experiences for, get this, millennials and Generation X. He's also going to share some of his uh, tips for marketing uh, on social media and other platforms, and uh, this is a super interesting conversation. I cannot wait for you to hear it. Before we get there, though, let's start with some travel news you may have missed. So it looks like 2023 may be the year that the travel industry finally makes a full recovery from some of the worst effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. A new report out from the American Hotel and Lodging Association forecasts a return to pre-pandemic demand levels for hotels across the country this year. Now, there's a lot in that report, but here are some of the highlights. Uh, The forecast projects a total of 1.3 billion occupied room nights for 2023, which is just above the 2019 record of 1.29 billion. Now, the report also says that in 2022, revenues for hotel rooms across the country hit $189 billion, surpassing 2019's revenues of $170 billion. And for 2023, the association is forecasting total revenues of $197 billion. Now, it is important to note that those revenue numbers aren't adjusted for inflation. And of course, uh, inflation has been a big deal over the past couple of years. And uh, although uh, the association expects room rates to continue rising throughout 2023, the high rate of inflation means that hoteliers still may not reach pre-pandemic levels of profitability for some time. Now, the report also indicated that staffing could continue to be an issue throughout 2023, with hotels employing just over 2 million people this year. That's compared to 2.35 million in 2019. But overall, it looks like hoteliers are poised to serve about as many travelers as they did in 2019, maybe more travelers with fewer staff members. Interesting news there from the American Hotel Lodging Association. We can all certainly hope that this is the year that uh, travel does fully recover on many fronts, including hotels and elsewhere. Well, now it's time for the road tip segment of our show. This is the time in every episode where we dig into our bag of tricks from our time on the road and share some tips with you that we think will help you have better and smoother trips with your groups. Today, I want to talk about staying hydrated on the road. You know, everybody gets thirsty when they travel, and uh, sometimes you might be used to having a quick cup of water that you can reach for in your home or in your office, and it's convenient, and you don't have to think about it, but then you find yourself traveling, and you don't have that convenience at hand. Now, many groups use way too many disposable water bottles to try to keep their people hydrated. Uh, You as a group leader are buying water for yourself. Maybe you feel like you need to buy and provide water for your travelers. Maybe your travelers are buying water bottles for themselves. Here's some problems with that. Number one, that gets really expensive, especially if you as the group leader or tour operator are buying case after case of water. Another problem with water bottles is they just clutter up the motor coach. Uh, They end up in the aisles, they're in seat back pockets, they can be a little bit of a pain to try to throw away as you finish them. And on top of that, it's not super easy to recycle water bottles on the road. There's no guarantee that if you do throw them away in the receptacles on the motor coach that those are actually going to be recycled. And not every hotel you're staying at is going to have a great recycling program too. So I want to suggest an alternative for you. Instead of hydrating everybody with water from disposable plastic bottles, why not hand out some branded reusable bottles to your travelers? Now, these are bottles that you can buy in bulk in advance. They don't have to be very fancy. They don't have to be very expensive. You can have your company or organization logo put on them. As we're going to hear in our featured conversation, free merch is a great way to add some value to your travelers and to expand the reach of your brand. And uh, if you go this route, those reusable water bottles are going to keep your mess down 
and they're going to reduce your trip's environmental footprint. And uh, you can plan ahead a little bit, work with your hotel and restaurant partners to allow your passengers to refill those bottles as they go. So you never have to worry about where people are going to get water along the way. Now, uh, there, there's no reason to be shy about this. Buying reusable water bottles will be a little bit of an upfront investment. But especially on longer trips, that investment may end up being cheaper than buying case after case of bottled water. And if you make that investment in adding value to your travelers, I think you will find that you might be able to charge more for your trip. You might find that your travelers are perceiving more value in what you offer. You might find that some people come back to travel with you again because of that perceived value or because of how they perceive you taking care of them or taking care of the environment on your trip. So think about reusable water bottles for your group's next adventure. Now I want to take a minute and share just a little bit of news from us. And you know that we put the Gather and Go podcast together. Maybe you know about our magazine, The Group Travel Leader. But I want to make sure that you also know about one of our other magazines called Select Traveler Magazine. If you plan travel for a high-end affinity organization, this is a magazine you need to be reading. Our readers include travel planners for banks, chambers of commerce, university alumni groups, museums, and other high-end affinity groups all over the country. And we publish the magazine quarterly. It is completely free. You can get it in print. You can get it online. You can sign up for our newsletter that accompanies it called Select Traveler Minute. You can find all those resources and read our articles online on the website, selecttraveler.com. I'm going to put that in the show notes to make it easy for you to find. Read the articles there. Subscribe. It's absolutely free. And if you are interested in advertising to reach that audience, if you own a tour company or you work uh, for a hotel or other uh, tourism industry company, we would love to connect you with the information that would help you reach those travelers. Uh, for that information, you can reach out to Kyle Anderson, our director of sales at 859-253-0455 or email him kyle at grouptravelleader.com. And again, that is all going to be in the show notes as well. Well, now it's just about time to get into our featured conversation with Andre Marable. Before we do, though, let me encourage you to hang around to the end of that interview, because at the end, I've got some thoughts to share with you about how the way you schedule your tours is impacting your traveler experience. We're going to talk about some of the mistakes you might be making and how you can correct them in today's hot minute. You won't want to miss that. We'll be right back with Andre Marable. All right, everybody, my guest today is an up and coming tourism entrepreneur who began exploring the United States as a food and wine enthusiast at the age of 21. In 2014, he founded the Pack Road Trip Travel Club, an organization that offers group travel experiences for millennial and Gen X travelers. The organization's trips highlight the food, wine, spirits, history, music, and culture of destinations in the U.S. and abroad. And it has been named Small Business of the Year by the Hampton Roads Chamber of Commerce. Andre Marable, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So I would love to know if uh, when you were, let's say, 18 years old, if you had any clue that uh, you would one day own a travel business. No, it definitely wasn't in the big picture. It's my interest in travel started out really young. I always watch shows like Glow Trekker, uh, Samantha Brown, uh, Rick Steves, and I always wanted to go to the same places they were visiting. And th from there, that's really sparked my interest in travel. Uh, I did a, a lot of personal travel on my own. I actually visited all 50 states. That was a goal I set out to do when I was like 21. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of led to me planning trips for my friends. We took a lot of road trips or group trips together. And since I've been to all these places before, they were like, Andre, you're planning this for us. <laughs> <laughs> so I started doing that for them. I took them to places that were off the beaten path. I took them to the major destinations, of course, and the major attractions. But I took them to places normally people wouldn't go to, like some of those mom and pop restaurants or a place locals would go to, like a little jazz hall and they loved mm. it and they were like andre you really have to do this full time as a business because mm. 
you're providing great experiences to people. And then I gave it a go with my coworkers. I planned a, a motor coast trip with my coworkers to Northern Virginia. And we went to a casino. We went to several museums on the DC mall and they actually loved it. And they were like, Andre, you got to do more of this. Like this was a great experience. And then from there, I looked into how to pursue my travel agent's license. And it that's where I stand now. I have my business. I started in 2014 and it's been going strong. I mean, more and more people are finding out about it and it keeps growing and growing. Yeah, that's fantastic, man. I, I want to follow up on a, a few things there. But first of all, did you manage to get all 50 states before you were 21 or is that taken you know, into some of adulthood? I managed to get to all 50 by 35, actually. That's an accomplishment. I'm impressed, man. I have two left to go. I've got Hawaii and Delaware still on my list. I don't know what's going to take me to Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go to Delaware. It's an amazing place. I think it gets under look and they have so many great attractions, restaurants. Definitely go to Delaware, especially Wilmington. Okay. All right. Well, I will take your uh, word for it and uh, it's on the list. So you, you put together this trip for your coworkers and you mentioned it was a motor coach trip. I'm curious, how were you even kind of aware of the motor coach as a means of, you know, traveling in groups? Because I think a lot of people, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. So how did coach travel in particular get on your radar? I actually took a few trips myself and I love the experience. And two, I always love growing up the whole road trip experience. Just people getting together, going to a place together, the fun you have along the way before you get to your destination. And I really want to duplicate that experience with uh, my coworkers, actually. And they loved it. They felt like a kid again being on those trips. And I said, let me just keep going on this path. And it's been a great success. So I'm, I'm, I want to keep going down that road for a minute because, uh, you know, chartering a motor coach for the first time had to be uh, a new experience for you, maybe a little bit intimidating. There's certainly some uh, expense there, you know, quite a bit of expense. So what was that experience like? How did you find a company? How did you make the numbers work? You know, if, for, for somebody who's never done this before, I think they would really benefit from hearing kind of how you figured that all out. Yes. Yeah, so one of my big things about selecting a company was the motor coach itself. A lot of people have the impression that motor coaches are dirty, they're cramped. Mm. They really don't provide a comfortable ride. And I wanted to kind of change that opinion. So mm. what I did, I interviewed several motor coach companies in the area, and I was really looking for a luxury coach because that's part mm. of the experience too. It's just the transportation side itself. And luckily we have quite a few companies in the Hampton Roads area, area to choose from. And that's what I based it off initially was just our experience, the ride, and I kind of want to demystify that opinion that motor coaches are dirty. Uh, but like you said, it's definitely a huge expense when it comes to renting a motor coach. It's usually about, I would say, 50 percent of my cost is the motor coach. So mm. it does take a upfront investment to find a company because you had to pay a deposit and find a service that meets your needs. It's it was actually kind of easy too, because like I said, with so many companies in the area, I had a lot to choose from. And once people mm. start seeing what I was doing, they were actually reaching out to me. So mm. that was a good thing. And I created great partnerships with all the companies in the area. And I used two primarily here locally that provides our transportation services. Yeah, that's cool. So that first time you had to put down that deposit, you, you had to just <laughs> dig into your pocket, come up with some cash and say, I hope this works. I hope I can sell this trip, right? Yes, that's the way it was. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you're in the Hampton Roads area, which for people who aren't aware is kind of the coastal area of uh, Southern Virginia right there on the water. Um, tell us about who your customers were in, say, that first year or so. And uh, what you know about who your customers are now, where they come from and what they're looking for. And, you know, if you have any kind of demographic insight on them. Definitely. So most of my customers are, of course, like you say, here in the Hampton Roads area, they're usually African-American females between the age of 35 and 50. They like low impact travel. They they're not going to go skydiving mm -hmm. or anything like that. 
uh, they also like, you know, fine dining. They like the arts. They like going to places to learn about the history and culture. And they also are one thing that's unique is that they're usually single or empty nesters that recently mm. got the kids out the house and they're looking for something to do. And I have a lot of military uh, spouses that come on the trip where their husband may be out to sea and they look they're looking mm. for something to do. Uh, so that's my primary demographic that I have for my group. Um, oh, also one thing to mention is usually like a middle income uh, tax bracket that they fit in. And they like to travel usually during the summer mm -hmm. months. Uh, a lot of my travelers do not like the fall travel or the winter travel, which is odd because that's when the best deals happen. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, they are definitely in another unique thing to note also is that they are price sensitive, like most people are. So my price mm -hmm. point has to be in a good range where they feel like they're getting a good value for their dollar. Yeah. So I'm curious, um, based on that price sensitivity, how are you navigating the world that we live in, in in 2023 where inflation continues to be a problem, inventory in some travel destinations is a problem that's driving prices up? How are you reacting to that? How are your customers reacting to the increase in prices from, say, pre-COVID? It's definitely been a sticker shock to me, and it has been a sticker shock to my customers also. Well, one thing I always focus on is the value that I'm providing with the trip. What are you getting for mm -hmm. the price point that I'm setting? And once they see that value, they're willing to pay that additional money to go on the trip with me. So that's how I've been getting around that particular obstacle is showing the value. And like I said, people are willing to pay that additional money for that value or that experience. I'd love to hear an example maybe of how that value conversation might go. Like what are some of the the bullet points that you're pointing out to people to help them really wrap their minds around that value? So one thing I would say to people is that you're going to get a great experience. You're not going to ride on a motor coach that may be cramped or dirty. We're going to stay at a hotel that's of good quality, that have a nice breakfast that you're going to enjoy. We're going to destinations where they're desirable and they are going to give you a personalized experience that you're not going to get if you were to go on your own. Uh, and that's one good point to make is that when I plan these trips for my members, I always work with the vendor to make sure they get something a little more unique than what they would get if they were going on a trip by themselves to the same destination. Gotcha. I'd love to hear an example or two of some of those things you've worked out with your partners in destinations that, you know, take a trip to the next level. Yeah, sometimes when we go to certain museums, I ask for like a historian to walk with us or to go with us and show the group around the museum, and explain some of the exhibits that they're looking at. And that adds a lot more value than they would if they were just to walk into a museum and just read a placard on the wall. Um, another way that I do add value is that when we go to a hotel, I work with that hotel to throw some kind of like welcome reception or something, you know, like they'll add a little like wow factor when they get off the bus, whether it's like a little goodie bag. Uh, those little touches add a lot to a trip and it, people remember that. So those are just some of the things that I do. I can't give out all my secrets, <laughs> <laughs> but those are some of the things that I do to add value that people see as a good thing when they travel with me. Yeah, for sure. Now I'm curious, uh, some people in your position are kind of part of the attraction themselves. What I mean by that is they are a big personality. They're maybe well known in their community. And some of what they're selling is, Hey, I'm going to be on this trip with you and I'm always the life of the party. So I guarantee that's going to be a good time. I don't necessarily get that vibe off you. Is, is you being there something that's important for these people? Or is it really more just the security of knowing that they've got a, a experienced travel pro with them on the trip? It's, Kind of both, actually. So one thing about my company, I started off doing this on my own from beginning mm -hmm. to end. I took care of, you know, collecting phone calls, collecting payments, answering questions, building a website. So people who travel with me with, in the last seven years, they have come to know me. 
And mm -hmm. when I finally started growing and hiring people to join me, when they first get on the bus, they're like, where's Andre at? So I became a part of the brand on mm -hmm. the trip itself. So I'm trying to work on breaking that right now with some of my my members and making sure the people that are working with me are, you know, they can feel safe with them when they travel. Uh, one additional thing, too, as you mentioned, is they feel value in that I am an expert because I've been to these places. I've done my research before we even get on the trip. Sometimes what I do is I provide information about their destination just to kind of build that excitement about the trip that they're going to be on. So you mentioned uh, the company's been growing. That's fantastic. Uh, I'm curious how you are finding customers. And I, I know you've done some different things to, you know, reach a wider audience. So um, I'm curious what has worked for you. A couple of things have worked for me in my favor and it's low cost, which I love. I, I don't like to spend a lot of money on advertisement. Mm. Um, the first thing is word of mouth. I, I treat my customers really well and provide a great experience that once they finish that trip or experience, they're going to go tell their friends. So that's been a huge help. The second thing I would recommend if you have a travel business is get T-shirts made. It's something so simple. I don't think a lot of people do it enough. If you have a shirt with your logo, your website, I had so many people walk up to me and ask about the travel club. And if they don't walk up to me, um, they go to our website and fill out the contact us form and say, hey, add me to your email list. I saw someone, some guy on the subway or on the bus or in the mall <laughs> with this shirt on. I want to know more about this organization. So that's the second way that has helped me tremendously. And it's a cheap way to publicize your business. I would say the third thing is probably social media. Uh, Facebook has been gold to me. And a lot of people get intimidated by social media. The biggest thing I would tell people to do is get linked up with an uh, expert on Facebook. Facebook actually works hard to, to try to promote and help businesses succeed. Uh, one of the programs I'm a part of is called Facebook Meta Elevate. And what they do is provide resources to business in the mm. form of training, credits, which has been a huge help with advertisements. So you feel comfortable advertising your business on social media. And it's really easy. Like I was, I have an IT background. I was intimidated by Facebook and all its alg algorithms, but it was easy once I got paired with a mentor from Facebook. So, and you have a wider reach on social media to promote your business with just a click of a button. So I highly recommend advertising on Facebook, Instagram. I do have a TikTok page, but I'm not on TikTok as much like I should be, but it's a big resource for travelers and I highly recommend it. Yeah. I, I want to ask about both the t-shirt thing and the Facebook thing, because I, I think there's a lot there in both of them. So uh, tell me more about the t-shirts. Is this something that you're making primarily for you and your team to wear? Are you handing them out to travelers on every trip? Uh, how, are people buying them from you? Are you just including it in the trip price? How does that work? All of the above, actually. So yeah. I wear them myself. My t-shirts vary a little bit from some of my um, customers or members. Uh, but what I do do is also provide a t-shirt after every trip to my members. Mm. So when they wear it, they're doing marketing for me and may not realize it too. Yeah. And then also I sell my t-shirts online. Uh, that has been a big success. I put some kind of crazy travel saying on it and people love it and they buy it and wear my shirt and they market for me <laughs> yeah. unintentionally sometimes. So I, I would definitely say work with a company. They have several companies out there like Custom Inc. and um, other companies that can create t-shirts for you. It's not as expensive as people think. And the payoff is big in the end. Yeah. And it probably goes to that idea of value like you were talking about too. It's something the traveler didn't necessarily know they were going to get. Uh, but then they get it, I, I don't know, at the beginning of the trip or you send it to them before or something like that. And they think, oh, this is cool. This is an extra little thing. And it just helps uh, go to that idea of you're really taking care of them. Yes, it really does. And 
if you travel with me, I think some of my earlier members, they have the socks, the hats, the <laughs> shirt. They have the full package. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So tell me more about Facebook. I'm curious when you say you've used Facebook to promote, what's the strategy there? Have you gone on and said, I have this specific trip on the specific date and I'm going to you know, promote that through paid posts or is it more image advertising, you know, just like, Hey, we've got this awesome group, come get involved. Tell me more about what that strategy has looked like. So I take several approaches on Facebook. One thing that I do is I always promote the destination. Uh, and these are not through the paid posts. So say, for example, we're going to Charleston. What I would do on Facebook to kind of build excitement about one of my trips is I would post different videos, pictures of Charleston itself. Mm. And people gravitate to that because they're like, I want to do that. So that builds a little buzz on social media. And also I create interactive posts on social media when I promote these trips. And it kind of helps me out with building the itinerary because I would post, for example, a certain destination, um, going to a plantation in Charleston. I would ask people, hey, would this be something you would be interested in? And I read their feedback and kind of, like I said, see if this is a good destination for us to go to. Mm. Uh, for the paid posts, I do promote the trip itself. Okay. And you got to create like little buzzwords when you create your posts, like exciting destination or, you know, you don't want to miss this trip just to get them to click to read more about what you're offering. And that has proven successful. So it's multiple ways I use to promote a particular trip or destination that we're going to. One thing I don't recommend is just don't post a graphic of this is a price point and mm. this is the trip we're going to. You gotta be a little bit more creative and using videos, images of the destination you're going to to get that initial draw for people to want to know more about a specific trip that you're hosting. Yeah, oh, that's great. I, I don't want to ask uh, too much of your, you know, your personal inside information, but I'd love to know when you're promoting one of these, if you're talking about a, a budget that is hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, tens of thousands, you know, what what sort of ballpark are we in to um, get that kind of reach on Facebook? And it's funny you mentioned that that's one of the big misconceptions about Facebook. You need like a huge budget to promote on Facebook. And that's not the case. A lot of times I usually spend like $50 to reach oh, wow. the particular audience that I'm looking to reach. And it's been really successful. Uh, luckily, I, as you stated earlier, I'm here in the Hampton Roads area. But even that with a $50 budget promoting for like two to three weeks, I'm able to get a lot of clicks of people just wanting to find out more information about a trip. So you don't have to have a big budget to promote on Facebook. And, and even if you only get one paid traveler from that, you've more than made up for that investment, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's wonderful. So um, I want to talk more about the people who travel with you. I've heard you call them members a couple of times. Is that um, a membership that they are, you know, feel like they're joining an organization? Do they pay dues or is it really just more of a way that you are kind of creating a sense of community among your travelers by calling them members? Yes. And that's the goal with the pack is to create a community of travelers. So I refer to them as members versus customers. Okay. And the reason I did that it was a recommendation by one of my members. They said, I don't like the word customer. <laughs> so that's when I start calling everyone members. And it, it did create like a, a community of travelers where we are more than just a community. We're actually like family. And one thing that I do a lot is I call my members up just to check in on them, particularly ones that travel with me frequently. I call them on their birthdays. Mm. Um, sometimes when they have events, they invite me out to their events. Yeah. So I just feel like we're more than just, they're more than just my customers. They're like family. Yeah. Wow. That's great. Now, uh, something that makes your members unique is their age brackets. Because when we talk about the general group tour market, you know, for years and years, people have kind of assumed, well, it's either students or it's seniors, you know, you're either in school or you're retired because people in their 30s and 40s and 50s they don't have the time they don't have the money that you know they're they're just not traveling in groups and even if they did have the time or money 
they wouldn't be interested in traveling in groups because they want to be independent. They don't want to be told where to go. They don't want to have a meeting time and a, you know, itinerary and all that. Somehow though, you have found a way to do group travel with Gen Xers, with millennials. Tell me how they react to all those things about group travel that traditionally people have thought would be off-putting. Yeah, they actually love it. They kind of like what you just mentioned. They were initially, I would say, I do get real reactions when I talk about group travel in our age range. But what makes it great for me, or I would say for them also, is that they see me traveling to all these different destinations and I fall within that age range. Mm. And that makes them want to travel with me also because they see the fun things that I'm doing, both from like a going to a museum to having fun at a bar. Mm. And that really attracts them because they want to have that type of fun too. So that's how I draw that group or age range in because like I said, I fall within that age range and people want to travel like I do. Yeah. Yeah. Super cool. Now, are you doing things intentionally when you plan an itinerary? Uh, Are you doing things that you think are going to appeal specifically to that age range, whether it's a a kind of place you're visiting or the pacing of the trip, uh, how early you start your days, how late the, you know, activities go, how are you really pegging it for people in that sort of primal life phase, as opposed to the way somebody might build a trip for senior citizens? Yeah, I try to do a combination of education um, and then also have a little fun at night. Uh, one thing about my age range, mm-hmm. even though we're kind of in that middle phase where we like to relax, but we like to have a little fun too. So that's how I plan mm-hmm. my itineraries usually is that during the day, we do more of the educational stuff. We'll take a tour of a city. We may go to a museum. Uh, we may to go to a certain attraction. But once the sun goes down, that's when we kind of get a little more livelier and go out to like a restaurant or a bar and create more of a fun atmosphere. Yeah. And And they love that. And then, too, one thing I learned along the way is that I like to give people a lot of, well, I say a little bit of free time so they can explore the city on their own. And the travel in my age group like that. They like the organization, but yet they still want a little more freedom to explore a city on their own. So I try to do that when I plan a Terry, have free time, time where we're all together, and then a time where we actually have a lot of fun. Yeah. So it sounds like uh, your morning may not start at 7 a.m. on your trips. It it might be a little more leisurely, for instance. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. I'm I'm all in favor of that. So you really taught yourself the travel business, the tour business in, in many ways. I'm curious, what were some of the challenges you encountered along the way in putting together, say, that the first two or three group trips And what are some of the really helpful things you have learned that might help another young travel entrepreneur or or somebody who would love to be a travel entrepreneur? Yeah, I have a few things, actually. We probably need another seminar or podcast (laughs) just on this particular topic. (laughs) Um, The first thing I would say is be patient. Mm. You're not going to become an overnight success. Mm. And that's something I had to learn along the way. Uh, it takes time to grow your business, your travel business. One, because you have to find your community. Mm. Uh, originally, my community, I thought, was going to be high school, maybe college. And I saw that I was getting people around my age. So I had to switch a lot of things up to accommodate that particular age range, as we already talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. Um the second thing I had to learn was dealing with people who are late. <laughs> I'm a person that's <laughs> always on time. Yeah. And some people don't have that same mindset. So one thing I learned is to develop a detailed itinerary for your travelers mm. and specify to them, we're on a tight schedule, please be on time. And that helped out a lot with overcoming that particular challenge. Mm. The third thing now is probably don't go on the cheap. Uh, As I stated earlier, provide your travels with a good experience, even when it comes down to just a motor coach. Uh, Make sure you pick a motor coach or transportation company that's reliable. They have a good safety record and your travelers will appreciate that. Same with the hotel. 
a lot of times we get we see that hotel price and get sticker shock. Mm. I will recommend, you know, picking that Marriott or maybe Hilton Hotel uh, because people are concerned about where they sleep at at night. Mm. So hotel is another thing uh, I would say focus on. So um, what do you wish your partners, tour suppliers, destinations, attractions, hotels, what do you wish they knew that would help them serve people like you better and people in your member demographic better? One thing I wish is something that a lot of tour travelers deal with is the hotels. As you already know, is the prices of hotels are astronomical. Mm. Uh, they have strict attrition sometimes. And people don't know what attrition is, is that you have to, once you sign a contract, you have to commit to a X number of rooms out of your estimated group block. And a lot of these companies are staying hard and fast to that attrition clause in those contracts. So I wish they were alleviated because sometimes with group travel, we just don't know. Mm. I plan my trips in advance, not knowing exactly the correct number of rooms that I'm going to need. And I wish they would give us a little more league weight with that. Hmm. Um, the second thing is with cancellation policies with hotels. Uh, we, I have had travelers cancel because of a health issue. And sometimes after they committed a price, I can't get that money back, particularly if they haven't paid for the trip in, fine, in full yet. Hmm. So the hotels is the one of the things that I'm working with that sometimes can be a challenge. And we also have partners that have been a huge help and relax those policies. So it's a mixed bag, but the hotels um, is probably the biggest uh, vendor I wish would work well with some of the, some of our group uh, travel leaders in the industry. Yeah, uh, that's, that's good to know. Hopefully they will heed that advice. So uh, you have a, a great website. Um, if people want to learn more about what you're doing or follow you on social or, uh, I don't know, maybe even get on your mailing list, uh, become part of the pack, what's the best way for them to do that? They can visit our website, www.thepackpacktravelclub.com. And we have a contact us page you can fill out to join our mailing list. Also, we have our several social media pages. We're on Facebook at the pack travel club and also Instagram at the pack travel club. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I sure appreciate your time before we let you go. We've got some questions that uh, we ask everybody uh, and these are just for fun. So no pressure you can shoot from the hip. Uh, first of all, when you fly, do you pick a window seat or an aisle seat? I pick a window seat. I love to look outside, see the clouds, see where I'm going, see the sight. So definitely a window seat. Yeah, it never gets old looking out the airplane window, does it? It doesn't. Okay, so uh, what's something in your carry-on when you travel that you would never leave home without? People always laugh at this. It's Ziploc bags, actually. <laughs> hmm. I use it for food. If something gets wet, I put wet clothes in there or a wet hat. I can't live without my Ziploc bags. Yeah, that's that's smart because uh, wet clothes, putting them in there with your dry clothes, if you've been out in the rain, that's just, just so gross. Okay, so if you had a week with nothing else to do and a free airline pass, where do you think you would go next? It would probably be Chicago. I have fell in love with Chicago from the food, the museums, the people. I just love that area now. And I, if I could go there once a month, I would. Yeah. So I would definitely say Chicago. Yeah. Solid choice. I love that city. And finally, what's something you have seen or done on the road that you would love to go back and do again with somebody you love? Course road trip. Just the experience itself. Just getting in the car, having fun, singing songs, making stops at various destinations along the way. I just love the whole road trip experience. And that came from my family. Mm. I mean, that's what we did growing up. So I would definitely say just going somewhere. It doesn't matter where. Just get in a car and just driving somewhere fun. The journey is the destination. Is that right? That's true. Fantastic. Andre Marable, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. 
Well, I sure hope you enjoyed that conversation with Andre as much as I did. It is always fascinating for me to hear from up and coming tourism entrepreneurs and find out about all the unique ideas they have that uh, maybe the rest of us just haven't thought of yet. And you know what? Even if you are not targeting Generation X travelers, millennial travelers, people in their 30s and 40s, I think Andre had some great ideas that can be applied across the board. So I want to take a few minutes to hit some of those again, just to make sure you don't miss them. You know, Andre said when he was setting up his first trip for his coworkers that he wanted to recreate the feeling of taking a road trip, which he loved doing with his family when he was a kid. He said he set it up that way and his travelers felt like kids again being on those trips. You know, I love this because there is something childlike about the experience of going on a road trip. And I think uh, there's something to be said for tapping into that childlike sense of wonder for your travelers, even if it has been a few decades or maybe a lot of decades since they were kids. If you can tap into that sense of wonder, you can resonate with them on an emotional level that they will never forget and they're going to appreciate. Uh, talking about his travelers, Andre said they are price sensitive. So his price point has to be in a range where they feel like they're getting a good value for their dollar. And he said in this current uh, environment of high inflation, he said, I always focus on the value I'm providing. What are you getting for the price point that I'm setting? Once they see that value, they're willing to pay the additional money to go on the trip with me. I think this is so important. Uh, it is no shock to anybody that the travel prices are frankly higher than they've ever been. Uh, they may not make sense to you. And it, sometimes I look at the prices of certain things and it frankly doesn't make sense to me. But you know what? I don't get to set the prices of a hotels. I just have to decide whether I'm going to pay that price to stay there or not. So when you are helping your travelers deal with a sticker shock, especially in a high inflation environment, try not to focus on the number, but instead focus their attention on the value you're providing. And if you can convince them of the value that they're going to get in traveling with you, then they may not be so hung up on that number and you're going to find they're willing to pay to go with you even if it's more than they initially thought it should be. Another thing Andre said is that I always work with my vendors to make sure customers are getting something a little bit unique that they couldn't get if they were traveling by themselves. And he said those little touches add a lot to a trip and people remember that. You know, that is one of the highest values of group travel is the ability we have to offer exclusive experiences and access to our guests. We should never take it for granted. We should never overlook it. And we should never forget to build that in to our travel programs. And finally, when we were talking about marketing on social media, Andre said this, he said, get linked up with an expert on Facebook because Facebook actually works hard to try to help businesses succeed. And he went on to say, there's a misperception that you need a huge budget to promote on Facebook. He said, a lot of times I'll use a budget of $50 to reach the audience I'm looking to reach. This is such good advice. You know, um, advertising online can be a hugely intimidating and difficult thing to wrap your head around, but it doesn't have to be. There are people out there that help you uh, either as a, a, on a paid basis, like from an agency or even getting linked up with one of these experts on Facebook or another platform that Andre mentioned. And you don't have to invest a ton of money. You just have to be smart, use some trial and error, and you might be surprised what kind of results you can get. Great stuff there from Andre Marable. Now, you may have also noticed in our conversation that Andre mentioned that uh, he doesn't like to start his days on the road too early because his travelers, well, they enjoy having fun in the evening. And that brings us to the topic of today's Hot Minute. Yeah, that's right. The Hot Minute is the portion of the show where I take 60 seconds to give you my unfiltered views on an issue impacting travel every day. And today we're going to talk about how the way you schedule your trips might be negatively impacting your traveler experience. So let's put 60 seconds on the clock and get into it. Okay, if you're like most group travel planners, there is a high probability that your days on the road are starting too early. Now, I've been on way too many tours that had hotel departures or group activities starting at like 7 a.m. or earlier. And here's my question. Who wants to get up that early on vacation? Now, you may have some early risers in your group, but I don't think everyone else in your group should have to conform to their schedule. 
If you feel like you need to provide something for those early risers to do, why not schedule some optional early morning activities and allow everybody else to sleep in a little bit later? After all, it's their vacation too. You know, the days of people wanting to be entertained and scheduled on every moment of a group trip, well, those days are really behind us. Instead, people want a great overall experience and very often less is more. Now, there may be a few very rare exceptions where a special activity requires a group to get up early, and that's okay. But in general, unless you have a plane to catch, your day should not start before 8 a.m. That's how I see it. Of course, you are free to disagree with me, and we can still be friends. And hey, agree, disagree, whatever you think, we would love to hear from you. I am always open to your thoughts, questions, comments, ideas. You can reach me at podcast at grouptravelleader.com. I read every email that comes into that address. And hey, you never know, your thoughts or questions might just be the topic of the next hot minute. And hey, while you're in the mood to give us some feedback, would you do me a favor? Go to your podcast player of choice. If you haven't already subscribed to the show, hit that subscribe or follow button. Give us a rating, give us a review. That helps us get the word out about Gather and Go and helps us grow our group travel community. I am so thankful to all of you who have done that. My thanks as well to Andre Marable for joining us today. On the next episode of Gather and Go, I'm going to bring you a conversation with Ted Clements of We Travel. We're going to talk all about how you can use smart technology to make your travel experience better from the purchase process all the way through to the end of the trip and beyond. You're not going to want to miss that. Until then, though, remember this. At the end of the day, we are all on this trip together. So let's make it a good one. See you next time on Gather and Go. Gather and Go is hosted and executive produced by me, Brian Jewell. Our publisher is Mac Lacey. Donya Simmons is our creative director. Ashley Ricks is our circulation manager and graphic designer. Our sales team is Kyle Anderson and Bryce Wilson. To advertise on the podcast, call Kyle or Bryce at 888-253-0455. Gather and Go is a production of The Group Travel Leader. For more information about our magazines, podcasts, and events, visit us online at grouptravelleader.com.